desperate tonight.
Good morning, everyone. Seems as though everyone's having a good time. Look at that, just quieting down. Boy, that's good. Respect for old people. That's what that's called. You'll learn that one of these days if you get. I hope so. Well, it's good to see all of you here. There's more people than I thought. I, I was worried when we got here early. People coming in really slow. But we've got a good crowd today, preacher. They should be all rested up, though. Yeah, you got an extra hour there. That, that extra hour meant a lot. We'll be going home early today. <laughs> it's good to see all of you. I hope you join in with the worship, do the, with the singing part, and with uh, some of you don't have to sing, but most of you can sing. Uh, but preacher's going to bring the word of God again, and he knows how to do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, how thankful we are today, Lord, to have the privilege to be in your house. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who has come this way, for the families. Lord, it's just awesome to have this privilege to be here to share together and to hear your word and, and to sing praises to your name. And for all that and so much more, we are thankful. Thank you for the activities that we have going on at the church. And I pray, Lord, that we will uh, take every opportunity to be a part of all of them uh, and learn from them because they're all part of what you have us do here at this church. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 You going to use your bulletin? I am not using my bulletin. I'm going to use last week's bulletin. A lot of people have asked about bulletins. Our computer systems are down this week, so we didn't get a chance to print those bulletins, so that's why we don't have one. Uh, but I'm going to read off of last week's uh, bulletin, and if I say something we've already done, then know it's last week's. Uh, our Veterans Day celebration is coming up this Thursday. That's at 11 o'clock. It's not just a church-wide, which is what it says. It is a church-wide, but it's also a community-wide. So we have these uh, invitations over here on the table when you leave today. If you know a veteran that would like to come, or you can invite them. Just pick one up and give this to them. And uh, we're going to celebrate our veterans here in the Wiregrass this Thursday at 11 o'clock. Okay. Uh, also, we have an opportunity to serve our shoe boxes. If you were here Wednesday night, Miss Shannon said we hit about 350 shoe boxes that we packed on Wednesday night. Uh, but there's still empty shoe boxes over here as you get ready to exit. Uh, you can grab a shoe box, pack those up, and bring those back next Sunday. Uh, we'll have our, our shoe box march. Uh, remember, it's, uh, ten, there's a $10 fee for shipping, so if you want to include that in there, you can do that as well. Uh, let's see. So if you're going to our HBC Thanksgiving, uh, the sign-up sheet is also over here on the side. You can sign up for that as well, and that's going to be out at the Braswell place. Uh, also, our... Uh, Bible studies are still going on on Tuesdays, 7.30 for the men, 10 o'clock for the women's. Uh, and that's all as far as our announcements go. I think Miss Sharon has something she'd like to share. Miss Sharon, come on up. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sharon is Sharon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> well, first of all, I just want to thank the Lord for what he did at the Fall Festival. Yeah. He, um, we had been praying for months, hours a week for the fall festival, and the Lord put on my heart to really pray for families to come, and I talked to Alice yesterday, and we both were just about shouting on the phone. Um, three years ago, we had 20 families sign up to want the church to contact them. Last year, we had 24 families sign up for the church to contact them. This past Sunday, we had 84 families. <laughs> I tell you what, I am Pentecostal, but I won't shout. <laughs> but I want to. Because, y'all, the Lord just said certain things he wanted us to do this year, and we did it out of obedience to him. And he is so faithful. And I want us to pray every day, y'all, that we're going to start seeing some of those 84 families. We're fixing to contact them. Amen. Come to church with these little children. I am ready. I had a little preschool class that I teach on Sunday mornings, and it didn't have any children this week. I had two last week and four. It's going to get full soon. Amen. 
we're just going to expect a miracle that God is going to show up, and he's already showed out this week. And I just want us to give him a hand, and every one of you, Brother Buddy told me I couldn't take five minutes. I can only get two. But I just, and I love you, Brother Buddy, but I know that I want God to get the glory for what he has done. And I also am going to say this. This isn't just something that's happened recently. God has been working on this, Brother Dale, for a long time through our grow teams and through the Jesus movies that we have, that Alice and all of our grow teams have done. Because Alice told me yesterday when she called me the second time, she said, Sharon, I just realized all these people live in those targeted areas that we have been serving and praying for for this year. It is a God thing. Thank you. Pray for me. I hurt my foot and I'm hopping a little bit, but God is good. Yes, Brother Dale. We had that registered, Brother Jeff, close to 300, and they were families, people. But we had, but that's not counting any of us. We had at least, that's how many registered, but everybody didn't register, and it doesn't count any of us members. So we are thanking and giving God all the glory. Thank you. Amen. All right, we're going to have a time of fellowship. Looking around the room, I see a few honored guests in the room. Here at Heritage, we don't have visitors. We have honored guests. And we're honored that you chose to be here and worship with us. You could have chose anywhere else to worship, but you chose to be here with us, and we don't take that opportunity lightly. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, we don't have a bulletin to fill out this week, but if you come back next week, we'll have an opportunity for you to fill out some information <laughs> so we can give you some information about us as well. So take just a few minutes to fellowship this morning. Make sure you seek out our honored guests. Give them a handshake or neck hug and tell them it's great to be in the house of the Lord.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day and your many blessings. Thank you for bringing us to this place, dear Lord, to hear your word, dear Lord. Allow our word, the words that you have given to Brother Jeff, dear Lord, to penetrate our hearts, dear Lord, and actually do something with what we hear your word say to our hearts, dear Lord. As we reach this time to give back to you a portion of what you've allowed us to have, dear Lord, allow us to give generously to spread the gospel. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And, you know, as we trust in the Lord and trust in those plans and that hope that he has for us, we know that all those things will work together for good to those of us that love him. And let's stand together. We're going to sing a song that's called My Only Hope is You, Lord. And uh, we're going to let the praise team sing through the first verse, and then we'll ask you to join us. Just some ladies, my only peace is you, Jesus. My only peace is you, Jesus. My only peace is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only peace is you. All right, men, my only joy is you. All the men. My only joy is you, Jesus. My only joy is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only joy is you. Together now. Oh, 
long as you're seeking my face, you're walking the power of my daily sufficient As I walk with you, I'm learning what your grace really means. The debt that I could never pay was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my to you for all that you've given to me. You ask me how many times will I pick you up when I keep on letting you down. And each time I will fall short of your glory, how long will forgiveness abound? And you answer, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, I'm this the power of your holy sufficient grace. been good so far today I hope you say that after I finish <laughs> y'all slip beside you to get your seat belt slip it on and let's go Romans chapter 8 uh, we're going to finish up chapter 8 this morning uh, some of you thought we were going to do that two weeks ago but we're we're actually doing that this morning uh, Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 34 if you came in this morning and you're a little bit discouraged, you're down, and maybe this has been a tough week, and you just need something encouraged, guess what? You're in the right place today because this is going to do it. Uh, this is it. Uh, this will encourage you today. Uh, I hope that you will walk out this morning with a smile on your face and a thankful heart for what God's done for us. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 34, and if you have found it and you're able to stand Let's stand together in honor and in reverence to reading God's word. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things who shall bring a charge against God's elect it is God who justifies who is he who condemns 
It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us all. Let's pray. Our Father, today we again want to thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ that has made all the difference in our lives, that we can have a right relationship with you, that we can be forgiven of our sins, and that as we belong to you, that nothing is going to separate us from you. Father, I pray today, thank you for these that are here and those that were unable to come for some reason this morning. But Father, we've come here to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. We've come here this morning to turn our mind's attention and our heart's affection to you because you are worthy. And Father, I pray that as we turn our attention to your written and spoken word in these next few moments, Father, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. May the Holy Spirit give us understanding to your word. And Father, may it not just stop within our minds, but may it also penetrate the deep places of our hearts. And Father, I pray again to this morning that you will have your hand on my life today. Father, I pray that every word that comes from my lips have come from your heart. And Father, I pray that we're going to receive it that we're going to make the application of it, that we're going to live it in our lives. And Father, I pray that when we leave this place this morning, when we go back to our homes, when we go back out into the community, when we go to the restaurant or wherever we go today, Father, I pray that we're going to be different people than when we came in this morning. And we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Now this morning, in verse 31, Paul begins with some rhetorical questions. Uh, I didn't know what a rhetorical question was until I got into college. Uh, a rhetorical question is one that uh, you ask to yourself pretty much. But Paul begins, he asks these four rhetorical questions, and listen, it is to, to, to drive home a point. Paul is bringing chapter 8 to a conclusion, and he's, he's bringing it to a point here, and you don't want to miss the point. These, these questions that he asks us. He begins with the question, what then shall we say to these things? Well, let's look at these four questions this morning, and I think we'll grasp and understand what Paul's talking about. First of all, that I want you to see this morning is that if God is for us, then who could be against us? Now let that sink in. If God is for you and me, then who can be against us? So Paul asks, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who can be against us? Now I think it's important to read this question correctly. If Paul had only asked who could be against us, the answer would be a lot of people. <laughs> There's a lot of people that could be against us. The answer is obviously that we have people that don't like us. We have people that are against us. They're against what we believe. They're against what we live for. But Paul's question is this. He says, if God is for us, who could be against us? In other words, who can really fight against us? Who can defeat us if God is the one that's on our side? Now, when I was growing up, we used to play uh, sports. We had a vacant lot. Actually, there were probably two, two lots together. But there was the two vacant lots there. And uh, we would play baseball. We would play football. We would play basketball at times. Uh, in the alley back there, in, uh, in that uh, uh, place that was vacant there. 
And uh, there was a, a large group. Uh, it was a good time to grow up as a kid. There was a large group of, uh, of uh, youth that were similar in age. And uh, we played ball up there all the time. I mean, there was always a, a dust cloud over that those two lots right there. And um, so we were about the same age. But there was one young guy that was two years older than the rest of us. And uh, my brother, he's he'll be listening to this sometime this week. But uh, Kelly, you'll remember uh, Georgie Englehart. Uh, Georgie was about two years older than the rest of us. And at that age, those two years were pretty significant. Uh, most of us, we were still kind of clumsy. Uh, our hand-eye coordination wasn't all that good yet. But Georgie was two years older. Uh, Georgie probably outweighed all of us by about 50 pounds. Uh, Georgie could run a whole lot faster than any of the rest of us. Uh, and plus, he was a pretty smart guy. And uh, when we would choose sides... You know, you have your two captains, and those two captains, they would be picking out of the people that are there uh, to see who's on the team. Now, once you got to the place where uh, you were the first one to pick that day, you know you had already won <laughs> because the first one selected was going to be Georgie Englehart. Uh, Georgie was, he was a, a very good athlete. And like I said, he was bigger, faster, stronger than the rest of us, probably smarter too. But if you had Georgie on your team, it was almost a lock. Uh, unless Georgie got hurt or Georgie's mom stopped and picked him up to go to the dentist or something. Uh, you, you had the team that was going to win. And uh, when I think about that, you know, it was kind of an unmatched advantage. Uh, if you had Georgie... You had the team. Well, it's as if Paul is challenging us to place all of our enemies and, and put it on one half of a scale, an old-fashioned balance scale, kind of like if you're weighing some peanuts. Then we have all the peanuts assembled on the scale on one side, and it's as if you throw an anvil on the other side. And it immediately crushes the other side down. And you know what happens to all the peanuts. They, they, they'll go flying in the air. That side comes crashing down and the peanuts are scattered. Again, Paul says there, if God is for us, peanuts on the scale, then who could be against us? Crash. No one can ever match the power of of the creator of the universe. When Almighty God is on your side, there is no enemy that can stand against you and I. But here's the second rhetorical question. Is there any chance that God will abandon us? Is there any chance that God will abandon us? No. There is no chance. You know, when, when I first married Aletha, uh, y'all just don't know that every time I mention her name, it, it costs me, okay? <laughs> I've, I've got a big tab. I've not paid up on that in quite a long time. If y'all don't know who my wife is, she's the one in the purple that's turning red at this moment. That just cost me even more right then. But when we first got married, I used to worry about, you know, that Aletha would somehow, over time, she's going to find out the real me, and she's not going to like the real me. Now, she probably is. She might have amen that. <laughs> I thought, you know, she might find somebody better than me, and, and I thought she might leave me. And, you know, I had a plan that if she left me, I was packing, I was going with her. <laughs> but there's a sense in which we often feel that same way about our relationship with Christ. We make a commitment to him and then become afraid that somehow in the time after that somehow God's going to leave us. He's going to leave us on our own and somehow we're not going to be able to survive on our own. 
Well, Paul argues the greater to the lesser. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, there's two parts to this argument, okay? First of all, God has already given us the greatest gift that he can give us. The greatest gift that we could ever be given. God has already invested heavily in us by giving us his son. Paul said God did not spare his own son. He could have spared his son. He could have called down a host of angels. God's love for me and you is deeper than any that we've ever known or we've ever experienced. God, I want you to know, is deeply committed to you and me. Deeply committed to us. He has met our greatest need. Some of you came in today and you thought your greatest need was to be able to pay your power bill or to make your mortgage payment or to make your car payment or, or to take out a loan to buy your gas. But... Uh, you, you might have thought that your greatest need might have been those things, but listen, our greatest need is salvation. That's it. To have salvation. Listen, I can't conceive of a love that could lead me to give up one of my children for any of you. Let's just be honest. That's, that's hard for me to fathom that. To know that God didn't even spare his son for you and me. God's love for us is so much deeper than we recognize and understand. And he's met our greatest need, and that is salvation and to have a new life. And he did that with great personal cost. He gave his son to every one of us. But here's another question that we've got to ask. We know God will provide, or a statement, I should say, we know that God's going to provide what we need. He's going to provide what we need. God has already demonstrated his commitment to us. He's already invested deeply in us. And folks, I want you to know something today that he's not about to abandon us now. He's led us this far. He's not going to give up on us. It's like that song that we've heard several times. It says that he didn't bring us this far to lead us. I know some of y'all got that look on your face like you want me to sing that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not. He didn't lead us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim, to let us drown. He didn't build his home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. I'm telling you something, that's a good song, but it's great truth. It's great truth. God will never desert us. God's never going to walk out the door on us. He's not going to abandon us. But he says that he's going to give us what we need. He's going to give us what we need. The Lord will provide a friend when we need it. God will provide. He will give us peace in the midst of a storm. He'll give us guidance when we're confused and we don't know which way to go, don't know what to do. He will provide comfort for us in those times of loss. He will give us strength to begin again when we have failed and when we've messed up. Our Lord is with us not just from the very beginning, but he's with us all the way to the finish. But here's the third rhetorical question that we need to look at. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Look at verse 33 with me just a moment. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Most every parent will tell you that, listen, you can criticize me. Say what you will about me. 
You can attack me. You can go after me. But if you attack my children, it's on. It's on. I like some of you ladies. Y'all got that mama bear sticker y'all have on your car? <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. But listen, people can say things about us, but listen, you're not going to pick on our kids. <laughs> I, I learned some hard things the hard way. Listen. We don't mind it if somebody criticizes us so much. We let them criticize our, our wife or, or our wife. Let uh, somebody criticize your husband or especially your children. You see, Paul co calls us here chosen. He calls us the chosen. We are those that have been specially loved by God. It's not because of what we've done to earn it. It's because when we put our faith and trust, we were then in the position of being in Christ. And because we are in Christ, we are His chosen. Now, I want you to notice three things about this. There's going to be charges that are made against us. If you live long enough in your life, you're going to have somebody that's going to have charges against us. Uh, have you found out that people will criticize you? They will. They'll criticize you. You didn't pick out the color carpet we wanted. You, you, didn't, you didn't pick out the kind of pews that we wanted. And some of you might want wanted chairs. And, but, you know, sometimes people, they'll criticize. They'll criticize all kinds of different things. People will, that are narrow-minded. Uh, some are judgmental. Uh, others will call us hypocrites, and they'll call us phonies. And there will be those who will who'll tell us that we're wrong in our beliefs. They'll tell us that we're wrong in our actions. But I don't want you to forget something here today. Don't ever forget that, listen, that Satan is the accuser. He's going to use people to do his work. And there are times that you're going to be accused of things. He'll be quick to point out our sins. He'll be quick to point out our, our struggles. You know, Satan frequently attacks God's children. You say, well, he's not been attacking me. You say, well, you might not just be living for him like you should. I promise you, if you're living... For the Lord, if you're sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ, then listen, he's going to come after you. He's going to attack you. How could someone who loves Jesus act that way? But here's the second thing. Many of the charges that people have against us, some of them are going to be true. <laughs> some of them will be true. Some of the things Satan will say about us are actually true. Some of the things others say about us are going to be true. But the verdict is already in. The verdict is already in. God has declared us not guilty. And I say this sometimes jokingly, but listen, if I'd have said that in a Pentecostal church, they would have had a foaming mouth fit. <laughs> God has declared you and me not guilty. If Jesus is legit, then God must have quit. Jesus is legit. And because of what Jesus did for us, you and I, we've been acquitted, even though we're guilty, even though we're guilty of doing the things that sometimes Satan accuses us of. The word he uses here is that word charge right there. You see that? It means to make a formal accusation in a, in a court setting, to, to press charges. And what Paul is saying is, who can make a, 
a charge against us and make it stick. That's what Paul's saying there. In our country, once the court has set you free, you can't be charged of that crime again. It's called double jeopardy. According to God's justice, you and I, we who are in Christ, were as guilty, but now we're unpunishable. Why? Why is that? Not because of, of some legal technicality. Rather, it's because uh, any and every sin that we've ever committed or will commit has been fully prosecuted in Christ on the cross. And once is all the law demands. That's all it ever demands. There are still consequences to the things that we do when we do wrong, even as believers. But as far as the penalty of the law is concerned, listen, Jesus' death, it places us in a wonderful position of being exempt from eternal punishment. Do we fail? Absolutely we do. Do we mess up regularly? Do we fall short of his glory on a regular basis? Do we miss the mark? Yes. Is some condemnation deserved? Absolutely. Are there times when our relationship with God will be stained because of our sin? Yes. Can these invalidate our salvation? Never. It can never and validate our salvation. Our sin, it's been paid for. God has already declared us not guilty. But here's the final question, rhetorical question. Who is he who condemns? Who is he who condemns? Just in case we didn't get the point, Paul asked his fourth question there, in verse 34, he says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So Paul gives us several reasons why nobody can condemn us. You want to hear what they are? Y'all give me that look like you want to know. Do you want to know why? First of all, it's because Jesus died for our sin. Listen, he didn't miss it. He didn't mess up. He didn't do it halfway. He said that it is finished, which means that everything that was necessary for our salvation, it was done. But here's something else. He rose to prove that this payment, that it was sufficient. It was sufficient. It was acceptable to God. And now our Savior is at the right hand of the Father, and he's interceding for us right now. And I love that word intercession. I did. I punched that little button on my computer this week to find out what the full meaning was that word intercession. It has the idea of someone who comes to our defense. Who was it that came to our defense? Jesus. Though some may want to condemn us, Jesus is always at the right hand of the Father to remind him that he was condemned in our place. The Savior, he rises to our defense. Suppose you pay a certain bill, but the owner of the company comes to you and threatens legal action. If you don't pay, what do you do? I 
I went to Office Depot this week, <laughs> and I, I bought my yearly calendar for the next year. Let's just suppose that I went in, and, and, and I got my little calendar, and I'm making it out to my truck to get back in to come to the church, and somebody rushes out there and says, hold up just a moment. You can't walk out with that calendar. You didn't pay for it. The authorities are on their way. You just stay right where you are. I pull out my receipt. I pull that out. And it cost $18.52 for that little calendar. And I gave them $19. And I got 48 cents back. We see, that didn't happen. But if it did, I had the receipt. I had the receipt. I got gas, I think it was yesterday or Friday, and uh, the guy in front of me, it took him forever. You ever been behind somebody like that? <laughs> it's like they got a $100 gas tank. You know, it takes $100 to fill it up. And, and I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And, waiting. and, and then I was watching... You know, you have to, if you use the credit card, you got to push the button to get your receipt. And uh, he didn't push that button. He pushed the other one that he didn't want a receipt. And I got to think, you know, I've always thought that, you know, if you pull in and get gas and you don't get your receipt and you go down the street and they say, well, hey, you didn't pay for your gas. Say, oh, yes, I did. You see, having a receipt is so important. You produce the receipt or you produce a, a canceled check. To show that you've indeed paid the bill. Listen, that receipt, it settles it, doesn't it? In a sense, every time someone makes a charge against us, Jesus produces the receipt. He paid the debt on our behalf. He paid it in full. Our Savior defends us from those that condemn us. And as we think about these four questions, there's just a real couple of uh, quick things that I need to add. I know y'all looking. Y'all see my clock. It says 1126. I can get them in just a second or two, okay? <laughs> First of all, I think it's important that we remember that these promises, they're only for believers. Only for believers. These affirmations are not for just people that go to church. They're not for people who try to be good or who are well respected. These affirmations are only for believers, for those who have put their faith and trust in Christ. And having reckon, recognized their own sin, they've recognized their, their own rebellion, they've turned to Jesus Christ for salvation. You see, that's a promise. That's only for believers. But second, these questions are not meant to be a an academic exercise for us, they're meant to influence us. They're meant to give us confidence. Our salvation is something that it is sure. Those who trust Christ, they're never going to be cast away. We're going to have our critics, and we'll have times when we stumble. We'll have times when we fall. But listen, God's love is going to remain sure. His promise of salvation is for everyone who believes in Him. He didn't lift us up to let us down. We've got to learn to keep our eyes focused on the promise. If God is for us, nobody can stand against us. No one can make a charge against you and make it stick. Nobody can condemn us because of the law of double jeopardy. God will never abandon his children. We are his, and he's going to take us home with him one day. And if we can keep these truths in our hearts, listen, we'll start living with confidence. There's many of us in here this morning. We're, we live our Christian life without the confidence that we should have. You see, if we've got confidence in him, then we're going to serve him boldly. We're going to serve him with joy. 
deep in our hearts. Listen, this will encourage us. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes just a moment? This morning, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you're not going to have that confidence. And you're not going to have these truths be true in your life. Jesus is the way. There's no other way. Jesus said that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't go any other way. It could be that somebody in here this morning, you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. Maybe today you need to be saved. Or maybe you're, you're not sure. Folks, if there's anything you ought to be sure about, it ought to be your salvation. That receipt is there when you receive Christ. Maybe you're a believer here this morning and you know you're not living for him like you should. Maybe you need to recommit yourself, rededicate yourself to him today. Or maybe you're here and God's been dealing with you about your church membership. Listen, we encourage that because in Scripture, it, it calls us to identify with believers. And there's no greater place to identify with believers than the church that Jesus established. Maybe God's dealing with you about being a part of this church, putting your shoulder to the Lord's work here. We'd love to have you. We would love to have you work with us to build the kingdom of God. But maybe this morning you're going through some hard times, some difficulties, some pains and problems. Listen, you can pray right where you are, and I hope that you'll feel open to, to be able to come and pray down front if you want to. I know some of you say, well, if we was in the sanctuary, I might would do that, but it's too close down here. Listen, it's really, you can do it where you are, but you're welcome to come and pray. But in the moments of invitation this morning, uh, what are you to do with what you've heard? Now, before we observe the Lord's Supper in a few moments, I also want to give an invitation to this. Every one of us need to examine ourselves before we partake of the Lord's Supper. And as we examine ourselves, is there any unconfessed and forsaken sin in our lives? And if there is, then we need to ask for forgiveness and repent of it. We need to recommit ourselves to him. And before we take it, we need to restore broken relationships with other believers. So during our invitation time, as we're preparing ourselves this morning to observe the Lord's Supper, what are we to do with what we've heard? We're going to stand in just a moment and sing our invitation hymn. And if God is speaking to you about a decision that needs to be made, listen, don't put it off. Do it today. Satan wants you to put it off. Matter of fact, Satan wants you to, to never do it. Do it today. No greater time, no greater place than right here, right now, this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and lives and in the life of our church. And we're excited about what you're doing. But Father, during this time of invitation, as we've heard your word, I pray that it will encourage every one of us that are born again of what we have in Jesus and what he has done for us, that Jesus is our receipt paid in full. Father, I pray for those that need and should make decisions today that we won't put it off. Would you unloose our grip off the chair in front of us? Lord, would you tear down the walls and barriers that we create in our lives to keep us from you? I pray that there will be a sweet freedom in this place for us to respond as the Holy Spirit leads. And we pray and ask your will to be done in these moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Buddy's going to come and lead us in our invitation hymn. And if God has spoken to you today about a decision that needs to be made, you come. We'll receive you today. Let's stand together.